Good morning. Good to see each of you out this morning on this uh, sort of a typical April day. I think uh, things are changing in the near horizon, so that's always good news. Uh, shout out to the Yates family. The, their boys, all three, will be, I've got a little bit of a ring going on here, uh, will be baptized in just a few minutes along with your wife. Uh, and, and you're going to be shooting pictures or something, right? Something like that. Okay, good, good. <laughs> Hold on just a second. I might need an extra stand if I can grab one. Now, if my wife had placed this beside me, she could have said uh, something to the effect, stand by your man or something along those lines. Little humor, very little humor. If you have your Bible, I invite you to take it and turn with me over to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6. Jesus, in his teaching, was oftentimes extremely practical. He would kind of go to the heart in terms of how he would speak, and certainly. As you read the Sermon on the Mount, that's, that's certainly the nature of uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. Um, as we see here, and, and we certainly are made aware of this throughout the Scriptures, that God has this capacity to be all-seeing and all-knowing, right? We call those the omni uh, characteristics or attributes of Him. But the Bible says these words concerning Him in the book of Hebrews. It says, No person, no creature is hidden from, him, from His sight, but all things are naked and open before the eyes of the one to whom we must give an account. The Scriptures have the capacity to, to go down deep and to examine us as well. The Bible says this, uh, that the, the Scriptures, the sacred Scriptures, are indeed the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of one's heart. So the inner life of a Christian sometimes is mixed, is it not? Sometimes there's good motivations, and sometimes there's motivations that come from more of a baser part of our nature. We call that the sinful uh, nature that we received or inherited from Adam. Only a supernaturally discerning person or agent such as the Word of God can help us at times in our life and our struggles to sort out what's going on in our lives in terms of what's motivating us, whether it's of the flesh or whether it's of the Spirit. In Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus talks about these kinds of things, and He not only talks about what we do, but he also addresses this whole matter of why we do what we do. The surface kinds of things are, are sometimes hard to discern, but he has that capacity to see really what's taking place in terms of what's pushing us in the direction of motivation. He talks about three different uh, spiritual exercises or spiritual disciplines. He talks about prayer. He talks about uh, fasting. He talks about giving of alms. So, what had happened in our Lord's Day among a special group of people, a group of Jewish people called the Pharisees, they kind of took it to a different place in terms of why they would do those three particular uh, spiritual exercises. It was all about themselves, drawing attention to themselves. It was sort of a benefit performance for their own personal benefit. For example, look with me before we jump down to the passage for the morning. Look with me to chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Notice it with me. But when you pray, we're talking about, again, those spiritual exercises or disciplines of the child of God, of the believer. Uh, Do not be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. The word stand there doesn't mean just standing erect as I am. It has the idea of... Um, of striking a pose so as to gain attention. So when they would pray or give alms in the, uh, the temple court or with the, uh, would fast, they would oftentimes do it to draw attention to themselves, striking a pose for, for attention. 
And Jesus says, you know, it's not only what you do, but it's a matter of why you do what you do that's so vitally important. And as we see here, uh, he says, when you pray, go into the inner room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will repay you. And of course he goes on and then he says the same kind of thing down in verse 16. He says, when you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. They neglect their appearance in order that they might be seen fasting by men. Now, it was kind of interesting, for example, the whole idea of fasting. It's uh, basically to set aside a, a very limited, concentrated period of time to really focus in on some, uh, some real heavy matter upon your heart and to engage in prayer. Uh, they took the fasting idea to a whole new level. For example, in the scriptures, only one day a year was designated as a day of fasting, which would have been the Day of Atonement. However, they would uh, do it on market days, Mondays and Thursdays. They would uh, see, set those two days aside for fasting, and typically they would find themselves in very prominent places. They would cover themselves with ashes and, and sackcloth and go through the motions as if they were truly engaging in a spiritual discipline, when in reality it was all about gaining attention. Uh, not doing it to the audience of one, but to, to many people in order that they might be seen by men. And of course, Jesus says, verily I say unto you, that very fleeting moment of, of superficial recognition is your reward. Beginning and end, that is the reward. Now, Jesus goes on here and he moves in the direction of uh, giving us very clear instruction on investments, on uh, insight, and then on influence. With that in mind, let's pick it up. Uh, looking in chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus here speaking says these words, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moss, moth and rust destroy and thieves break into steel. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves break in or steal. For where your treasure is, so also will your heart be? Now, some people have read this passage and kind of concluded, well, we probably don't need to really set, uh, set aside anything or save anything for the future because, I mean, he says, you know, you're to basically invest in a heavenly stewardship, okay? That's certainly not what he is saying here. Uh, for example, we think about the entirety of Scripture. We think of, um, for example, uh, Proverbs chapter 6, which says these words. It says, Go to the ant and consider its ways. Be wise. It has no commander. It has no overseer. It has no ruler. Yet it stores up its provisions in the summer, gathers food uh, for the harvest. So what's Jesus talking about? He's not condemning savings, nor is he telling us to give everything that we have away. The idea is this. What's really at the heart of what he is saying? He's warning us about storing up our goods when it's our motive to find our security in the things that we possess. Let me repeat that. What's he talking about here is a warning about storing up our goods and hoping to find our ultimate security in those things that we have collected or possessed. For example, I used to uh, spend time with a, an older gentleman out in Kansas City. I pastored out there in the 80s. And um, a guy by the name of Paul Hockey, the guy literally could do anything with his hands. Uh, he was an engineer by trade, worked for uh, a company for, for probably 40 years. But he had a, a, a large utility barn, I guess you would call it a, a pole barn, probably half the size of a football field, and it was filled with antique cars and trucks. I mean, he would buy them and he would restore them. He had a house that was probably eight or 9,000 square feet. He had these gigantic, what was called swing, swinging pendulum clocks that he would build and restore. Each was at that time valued at 10 to 15 to $20,000. He had tons of them throughout the house. He could build grandfather clocks from scratch or from just a, a little gear of, of what a clock might, you know, you might find the gear of a clock and he could build it around it and build a beautiful, gorgeous uh, uh, grandfather clock. He could do all those things with his hands. 
I shared the gospel with him many, many times, and he uh, did not respond at that time. And I took a fellow with me by the name of Dr. Lester Pipkin, who happened to be the president of our Bible college. He was speaking one weekend at our church. So I thought, you know, Dr. Pipkin being this uh, rather impressive, stately, deep voice, you thought you would talk listening to God. I mean, that's how he talked. And he would always have people's attention. So we took Dr. Pipkin over to visit Mr. Hockey. And he asked him this question, this very insightful question. He said, Mr. Hockey, do you find pleasure or joy in the creating of all these things or in the possessing of all these things? And Mr. Hockey, without a hesitation, said these words, which I was surprised. It's in the having of these things. It's in the possession of these things. That's what Jesus is warning against. You know, getting all you can, canning all you get, and going around showing everyone what, what you got in your can. You see, so money is not for keeping score in the game of life. It's entrusted to us as believers in order that we might meet needs, might meet needs among our, our physical family, might meet needs among our, our uh, spiritual family, our church body family, our community, and perhaps beyond as God brings things to our attention. So he says here, uh, you know, you need some help with being a good investor, investor so, so don't merely lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Why? Well, a couple, three or four, five, six, seven reasons probably, but basically we summarize it in this way, because they're short-lived and soon lost, right? Subject to all kinds of perils, he mentions two or three here in verse 19, Stocks and bonds are at the constant mercy of a fluctuating market. Probably what you had two years ago is not worth as much as it was back, you know, 24 months ago. It's changed. Things are rapidly changing. So he's saying here, in contrast to laying up treasures here upon the earth and investing merely on the horizontal, notice what he says in verse 20. He, put, he, he really promotes uh, an eternal portfolio, if you will. And, and notice what he says here in verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth nor rust destroys and, and thieves break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Listen. He's talking about investing in that which is eternal. There's only two things eternal that I'm aware of. Perhaps you can help me with this. Uh, I learned this from an old oil man that became a discipler of men from Oklahoma. His name was Dick Grant. He said, friends, there's only two things that are eternal, the Word of God and people. So when you and I invest in the Word of God and in people, in the cause of Christ, uh, we are investing in an eternal portfolio that will never, ever, 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 ever collapse. We need to understand that. When I die, I had a funeral just a few days ago. There was no U-Haul on the backside of the uh, funeral hearse. I just want you to know that, okay? You don't take it with you. You came in uh, with nothing. You leave in the same manner, but you can send it ahead, right? And how do we do that? By investing in the two things that are eternal, namely the Word of God and the work of God and people. Origen, the great church father, said Christians are money changers who take the capital of this earth and change it for the currency of heaven. A lot of times people say, well, what did he leave behind? When a person dies, what did he leave behind? I think the angels in heaven have yet a different question. What is it that he sent ahead, right? A man is no fool, listen, a man is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he'll never lose. You've heard that before. A great missionary spokesman said that who gave his life for Christ. A man in New York City um, had a wife and she loved cats. Any cat lovers here? If you are, please don't be mad at me at the end of the illustration because I'm not advocating any kind of animal abuse, but this is the true story. She loved the cat. He hated the cat. He'd go to sleep in the middle of the night. What would happen? That cat would jump up on the bed and, and wake him up. He didn't like the smell of the litter box. We have a cat who, uh, 
He was on the top of the roof the other night meowing at 2 a.m. I mean, I'm not really fond of that piece of it either, but I, I kind of like him. He takes care of our varmints around the house, and he also uh, has a way of presenting a gift at our front door. Usually, you know, it's a, a baby rabbit. I, I don't like that, but uh, a, a bird or mice. We're okay with mice and other rodent-type animals that disturb the ground, the kinds of... You have them in your front yard. What do they call those things that pop the ground up? Moles. Yeah, he takes care of the moles too. So, so anyhow, this guy just didn't like the cats, and so she was going to take a three or four day trip, and so she does, and, and I'm not advocating this, so don't be mad at me. He, he got the cat, he lived in New York City, put it in a bag with a box, a few rocks, throw it over the bridge in the Hudson River. That's what he did. She comes back and she asks about the cat and he doesn't give her an explanation. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I know you love the cat. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put an ad in the newspaper so that uh, this week, hopefully, we will have the cat returned. I'm going to offer $500 to anyone who can provide information leading to the recovery of the cat. Well, nothing happened. He said, honey, I love you so much. This was the following week after that week. I'm going to up the ante to $1,000. And so he does. He runs yet a second ad. And the friend saw this ad in the, in the newspaper and says, you must be nuts. There's not a cat on the face of the earth that's worth $1,000. And this is how he responded. Well, when you know what I know, you can afford to be generous. <laughs> hey, listen, if you and I have any inkling of what it means to be a part of God's kingdom, we can afford to be generous, right? Jesus isn't advocating poverty, but he is advocating priority. And when you know what you and I know as children of God, a part of the family of God, yes, we too can afford to be generous. His words on investment. Secondly, his words on insight. Notice what he says here in verses 22 and 23. The, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? Now, here Jesus uses the eye to symbolize our perspective in life. In other words, are we living with a sense of, of spiritual farsightedness? In other words, are we living with an eternal perspective in view? Are we living with, with the backdrop of eternity in our minds when we make decisions, when we map out life? That's what he's talking about. He's saying here, hey, listen, if you are, then your eye is good. Your life, your existence will be full of light, which means you'll not be stumbling over all the transitory trinkets of life that so many people go after. Your investments will be enlightened. You'll be engaging in eternal investments. You see, the revealing light of the eternal outlook enables us to see the importance of exchanging the junk bonds of this world, this earth, for the precious jewels and stones of heaven. The value of an eternally oriented eyesight. But notice the vacuum if we are merely looking at life in the immediate or the here or now. Notice what he says. He says uh, in verse 23, if your eye is bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. This talks about the vacuum of, a, of an earthly-oriented eyesight. If our eyes are, are, are bad, clouded by the fog and, and um, a mist of earthbound nearsightedness, then we're going to miss out, in essence, he is saying. A person who lives this life as if this is all there is promotes darkness among his own existence as well as those whom he has influence upon. The Bible says uh, the world now is in the process of passing away and the lust thereof, but the one who, who embraces the will of God, uh, that will endure forever. Those who do the will of God, those are the ones who abide forever. Notice verse 24, we see Christ mentioning here words concerning influence. Notice uh, with me, verse 24. 
I'm on the wrong chapter. Here we go. There we go. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold the one or despise the other. You, you cannot serve God and mammon. In the Far Eastern culture of our Lord's day, the concept of love and hate had little to do with emotion, so we need to keep that in mind. The focus when using that word in that day, in this context, for example, has the idea of devotion and priority, okay? So he's saying, listen, you can't dance to the music of two orchestras at the same time. You cannot be married to two people at the same time. You cannot worship in, in the uh, synagogue or the temple of two separate gods simultaneously. One will ultimately govern your life, determine your priority, and will set for you a definition of success. Two masters. One calls you to be humble. One calls you to be proud. One calls you to set your affection upon things above. The other calls you to set your affection upon things here upon the earth. One calls you to look to the unseen and the eternal. The other calls you to look at the seen as well as the temporal. C.S. Lewis said these words, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for this present world were those who thought the most about the next. Think about that for a minute. Read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for this present world are the ones who thought the most about the next world. So we fix our eyes, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. We fix our eyes not upon those things that are seen, but upon that which is unseen, since that which is seen is, is temporal, but that which is unseen is eternal. Listen, any temporary possession can be turned into everlasting wealth when it's given to Christ. At that very moment, it is touched with immortality. So, we see investing that lasts. His words on investments, his word on insight, and his word on influence. Would you bow with me as we pray? Well, it's so easy, is it not, with our heads bowed this morning to get so caught up, you know. Someone says, we're, we're sometimes so uh, earthly-minded, we're no heavenly good. Well, we don't want to be like that, do we? We want to set our affection upon things above. We want to fix our eyes upon that which is unseen, because the seen is temporary, it's fleeting, it's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. But that which is unseen investing in people and in the Word of God, well, that, that goes on forever. It will outlive you by a long shot. And so we're encouraged to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven that can't be compromised, can't be tampered with, cannot be stolen or embezzled. So we need to be thinking and setting our affections upon things above, not merely upon things here upon the earth. So in the quietness of this moment, would you just uh, sort of talk to the Lord and say, Lord, help me become a kingdom seeker, moving in the direction of seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness and allow all these little contingencies of life to be met by you because you have said you will do that far beyond our wildest dream and expectations. So, Lord, uh, work among our hearts. Help us to realign our lives because we're bumped around in this world so often that we find ourselves misaligned. And, and Lord, help us to focus on the things that really matter, the things that are eternal, the things which are unseen. We thank you, Father, for the Word of God, and we thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with these dear folk. We pray that you'd work in our hearts and lives to bring about those wonderful transformations and changes that need to take place. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.